another episode of Roundtable hosted by the United Workers Party. My name is Nancy Charles and I am your host for this evening. And I have with me our first guest for our first segment, the leader of the opposition and the parliamentary representative for Mikud South, Honorable Alan Michael Shastney. Welcome, political leader. Great to be here with you. Okay. So for the last couple of days, we've been hearing a lot about the estimates of revenue and expenditure as being presented by the Honorable Prime Minister. There were a lot of statements being made in the estimates and there was the debate in the House as well um, by the lower house, as you understand it. I don't think the Senate debates the estimates, so it's just the parliamentarians. And so I think that it is appropriate on round table that the opposition, seeing that we only have two members of parliament, which would be yourself and Honorable Bradley Felix, that we take a bite of the cherry in terms of dissecting the estimates of revenue expenditure, explaining to St. Lucians what are some of the critical aspects in the um, presentation as made by the Prime Minister and the other members of his cabinet, um, so that St. Lucians can understand what is in there for me and what is also missing in there for me. But to begin the process, I think I have since learned that a lot of St. Lucians don't understand what is the budget, how does it work, etc. And I think being a former Minister of Finance and Prime Minister, why don't you take us through the process of preparing a budget, an annual budget for the country? How does it work? What is the process involved? As simple as possible. Um, it's exactly that. So basically, you, in government, you have different departments. Um, we would describe it in business terms that each department has its own profit and loss statement. Okay, um, And you have some very fixed cost or what we call recurrent expenditures. Mm -hmm. So your utilities, um, you don't expect to see a lot of changes mm -hmm. unless you go to new technology, um, wages, um, and debt financing. Right. So right? these things are fix more or less, they do not change, but if they change, it's just very slightly. Right, so, I mean, a very good example would be, you know, people you say, how long did it take you to put together the budget? Well, for me, as the Minister of Finance, it used to take a minute and a half. <laughs> right? Why is that? Because the, the salaries are $500 million a year, mm -hmm. right? Um, the debt financing is $365 million a year. And then um, the operating cost of government, so utilities, um, uh, Rental. rentals, subcontracts, mm -hmm. transportation, travel, all those things, Stationary right, things like that. is another $360, uh, $360 million a year. Right. So by the time you turn around, you're already at $1.1 billion. So the, the, the discretionary decision that you have to make is simply what's the difference between that and revenue. Okay. Okay. And so um, revenue becomes a much more complicated thing to some extent. Um, because your policies have a significant influence or impact on your revenue. Okay. So if you're increasing taxes, generally speaking, government's revenue should go up. Right. Should. Um, and if there are uh, new things you're doing, if you've opened up a new building or you're expecting uh, ec economic growth, you can project a higher revenue number. Mm -hmm. And that helps you determine uh, what kind of gap you're going to have. Because pretty much, um, for the most part, in our modern era, so let's say from 1997, and I'm not being political, right. um, that you've governments have run continuously deficits. Deficit budget, right. Meaning that our expenditures um, for um, uh, wages, um, wages and salaries for interest payments, debt financing, and operating costs have tended to be higher than the revenue that we were earning. So can you explain to us, because I have here with me the estimates of revenue and expenditure, as you spoke about deficit. I think the government is boasting about a current surplus and not a current deficit. And so when the ordinary St. Lucian hears that we had a surplus, they do not understand that it's a current surplus and not necessarily an overall. So can you explain to us what is the difference between a current surplus and your overall? deficit so the current surplus would be limited to certain cost items okay so does your revenue cover those cost items so right. is your revenue covering um, the cost of wages and your operating costs so that's your primary so once your revenue can cover those costs you, then it, technically you can either have a current surplus right and and the importance of a surplus because surpluses are good 
right? It means you have to borrow less money. Right. Okay? Um, and again, uh, international institutions as a guideline like for countries to have a primary surplus. Okay. Okay? You would need a current surplus and even better yet, an overall surplus. When you have an overall surplus, what it's saying is you're making enough revenue um, to pay for all of your basic expenses. All your recurrent and then all your capital. And then all your capital. But we're not at that stage yet. No, but and, and, and that's the argument, right, Nancy, that's been there, is that the small island developing states, so countries like St. Lucia, that did not exist when the Brenton Woods system was created. So I'm getting complicated here. Right. Um, after World War II, there was a new economic order that was put in. Okay. A lot of persons don't realize, I mean, I think a lot of young people would, or even elderly would appreciate the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan, which was the recovery of the Europe, became the OECD. Mm. Okay? And there were new rules put in place, right, to determine the wealth of a country and the success of a country. Ah, okay. Small island developing states like St. Lucia didn't exist. And so we've been arguing that a lot of the um, measurements that are used are biased against us. Because so, you're small. Right, so you take um, uh, uh, per capita GDP. So per capita is just taking your GDP and dividing it by your population. Some people would interpret it, that's the wealth of each individual citizen. We all know in St. Lucia that that's not the okay. case and in small island developing states. But we say in absolute terms, means that the total GDP is too small. So when you have a, a, uh, a crisis, a hurricane, mm -hmm. price shocks, mm -hmm. etc., there's not enough reserves. But what they're saying is if your per capita GDP is higher than $10,000 per person, yes, that they will not lend you money at concessionary rates. Wow. You're considered to be a wealthy country, and therefore you need to pay your own way. Okay, well, back to the budget again. So, as a former Minister of Finance, and we spoke about our surplus and our deficit, and you said it takes a very short period of time, I mean technically, but we do know that it's a longer process, but really is to look at the bottom part. After you've covered your current expenses, what is the balance of money that you have left for you to pump into the economy in terms of your capital projects? How do you determine what to cut and what to increase? What are the factors that would determine those cuts? Because we, we, we see that there's been a number of cuts in certain depart de departments in this budget. So for example, um, I will not go to some of the critical ones yet, but let's say for example, economic development, the previous budget allocation was 105 million. It has gone up to 140 million. So that's an increase of 35 million. Whereas let's say the Department of Agriculture, for example, it was at 44 million. It's gone down to 41 million. So that's a cut of $3 million. How do you make that decision as a Minister of Finance, who to cut and who to increase? So that's where now the, um, the time is spent. So I'm saying to you, agreeing on what the overall numbers are, okay, is, is easy. You spend a bulk of the time now haggling. On the detail. Okay. Okay. Um, each country, is, each government, sorry, is going to do it differently. Mm -hmm. So you'll remember in 2016, when we started the process of the budget, right? What I realized was, because remember I used to work for government um, in economic, uh, planning right. in, back in 1984. Okay. So I, I, I wasn't coming into this. Well, you were in economic planning, you've been in tourism, and then you were former minister of tourism. Correct. So you would have had the experience of going through uh, that this, process, this process quite a few times. And what I realized is that, that it was the same uh, practice. Everybody had their pet projects that they wanted. Mm -hmm. They would come to the government and increase their cost by 5%, 6%. Right? and give them space to, not illegally, but to maneuver monies within their programs. So when you say everybody, are we talking about the, the technical people within the ministry or the ministers in collaboration with the technical people? No, the, the initial part is never really. Well, there would be some collaboration with the ministers because the permanent secretary would convince a minister that this is a very important project. For the ministry. Because the ministry. She's, she, he or she is the technical person. And as a minister, you will probably most likely have to listen to what the technical people are saying in terms of moving that ministry forward. Right. Right. So um, what I quickly realized is that we were still doing that. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Way back when you were in economic planning. Well, it had been a practice before that I didn't understand as a younger person, mm-hmm. but as I went through as Minister of Tourism, etc., and now coming as the Minister of Finance, when you ask a couple of questions, you just realize that all people did was they just increased their cost. They just guesstimate, we'll increase that by 5%, decrease that by 2%, increase that one by 10. Yes, and then um, there may be some increase because they'll attempt to put a a project in, Mm -hmm. okay? Um, But that's not the way you should do it. So the the point is is that governments and the, the ministers in particular and the prime minister, even more importantly, have to have an idea where do you want to go? What's the, is, is there a one-year plan, mm-hmm. right? Or are we going to measure this by a five-year plan? Or are we going to measure this by a 10-year plan? Now, if we are, have been underachieving, the question is, you're not going to solve that problem in one year. So how do I now um, uh, embark on a new way of putting the budget together that I can see we're going to grow our GDP by 100%? So you were looking at futuristic planning and not necessary plan per year, but you were planning for the future. Correct. And the problem is when you do it by year, it just becomes a slight increase. Right. Because it's marginal. But you have no idea if that's making any changes. So you remember, when I brought the ministries in, I said to the ministries, there has been no structural change in how you're going about doing your business. So whether it was education, whether it was um, uh, infrastructure, um, whether it was health, right? So I need to know where do you want to be in 10 years, okay? And so if you know today what you've done in the past, Mm -hmm. okay, and where you want to go, and you were starting your ministry over again, you had the benefit of saying, I'm going to redo this ministry to deal with where I want to take it to, yes? what would it look like? That's a, that's, a, that's a good question to ask. Right. And they couldn't answer it. Right. And yeah. is that why you thought it was important to now bring in an outside agency, somebody from the outside looking in, to help them answer that question and to put that sort of forward thinking into the budget process? So unlike what is being projected, it did not come in and write the budget for the ministers. Okay. That's not what the consultancy so, was about. So the consultancy for Ernst & Young, they did not come in to prepare the budget for the ministries. No, their okay. job was to work with the ministries mm-hmm. in putting together what we call KPIs. Okay? What's that? So basically, it's targets. Mm-hmm. Right? So in the case of the Ministry of Health, mm-hmm. we're going to reduce diabetes by such so, and such. So KPI would be a key performance indicator. Okay, so you, you have to determine this is what you want to achieve yes and this is what you're going to do to achieve this and here's the cost and here's the cost of it right Right. the key here what the ministries were suffering from is thinking out of the side of the box right they were not able to look past what they had been doing forever increasing the number by five and that's understandable because they've been doing this for so long right so i don't think it was a blame game to say listen you are incompetent and you cannot do this but it was understanding that you have been doing something for so long and we do understand that change sometimes is difficult and so you thought in your wisdom as the minister that you would bring in somebody on the outside to help them think like you said outside of the box so how we, did that go well we went through the same process in the, as a political party right you're gonna rem- re- i'm gonna remind you something <laughs> yes. okay i said if in fact that you there's an expectation that the ministry of health is supposed to be reducing the um diabetes by x percentage mm-hmm. per year okay and it's not happening. The first question you're supposed to ask, and this is where people want to make the comparison, say, I say, oh, I'm, I think that government is a business. No, business practices and methodology can be applied to the operations within government. Ag- agree. Because it's just managing yes. resources, okay? So the first question you must ask, do the people in the Ministry of Health, right, know what their job is? So technically, it's a job description. Mm-hmm. So you'll be surprised, you know, you're in business that when you have staff that are not performing and you're going to ask them the question, tell me what your job description is, and you sit back and wait, you'll be shocked to hear they don't know. So the first set of training is to say, let me tell you what your job description mm-hmm. is, okay? If they still are not performing, the next question you ask is, do they know how to do what they're supposed to So again, if I sit down with you and I say, explain to me, 
now that you know what you're supposed to be doing, explain to me how you're going to do this. If in fact I realize they don't know how, I train them again. Mm -hmm. Now if after they know what they're supposed to do, they know how they're supposed to do it, and they still don't do it, the third thing that the business practice say, do you care? I can't train care. Care, yes, it has to come from within. Right. And that's where civil servants must play a bigger role, is to understand as a civil servant, your services are very, very important in the scheme of things, and you must take pride in it. You must want to see that government services are benefiting the general public. So when we brought um, uh, uh, um, Ernst and Young in, mm -hmm. was to help the, uh, particularly the, the budgeting departments, the accounting departments, of the and the various ministries. ministries, how that works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that when they came to, because I asked them a simple question, I said, tell me where you want to go, and if in fact you could start from over again, right? Give me a plan as to what you want to look like, and then give me a three-year plan, because remember I said it was going to take three yes. years, and that's generally what it takes, mm -hmm. because it takes time for it these things time. to be absorbed, yes. that in a, in a three-year period of time, that you would have transformed into this new, this new entity, okay? Well, I think it was very reasonable, and, and being part of the former administration, that it was reasonable to try to get us as a country um, to think outside of the box, but to also think futuristically, not only looking at today and this year, okay, what are we doing this year, but to say, what is it we want to achieve in the next three years? And so you now have a plan that in year one, I'm going to do this, in year two, I'm going to do this, in year three, I'm going to do this. So you know you're working towards a goal. And, and let's see what happened. We were introduced by CDB mm -hmm. um, to a, a, a new project called the Delivery Unit. Yes. So again, I want everyone to know, you cannot be overly ambitious. Change is tough and requires time and patience. We identified six things yes. which we said were key indicators. So in the first five years of our administration was to fix the health care, fix the education, fix how we, fix, uh, we, we maintain and, and, and do roads. Mm -hmm. So when you take infrastructure as an, as an example, right? where are the new roads going to be? Where do we expect? Where, we expect where do you expect the population the growth to, to go in the so next that, five years? So you or next sure fifteen years, you have, twenty years, because yep. you need to be planning that far in advance. Where are your new schools going to go? Where are your new water plants going to go? So that you are now coordinating the developments. Because what you don't want to do, and that's what's been happening in Saint Lucia, Nancy, is the population have been making those decisions by themselves mm -hmm. by squatting. Yep. So and then you now have to end up going and then start cutting roads and putting in To rationalize after the fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to now, you want to actually get ahead of your development. You want to start now projecting and directing development where it's going to go. So if we want to con in convince people to live in a suburb, put a proper road, put proper schools, improve the quality of life in that area, and you'll see that people are going to make, make land available. Well, political leader, I do have to say to you, it's rather unfortunate that for political purposes, you had the then opposition making it seem that it was such a bad thing for you want to think in of the future and where do we want to go. Um, and I think to a certain extent, they discouraged a lot of the public servants and even citizens of the country as well in terms of thinking big and thinking that the United Workers Party administration was too ambitious. But let's get back to the estimates because as you know, we have limited time and there's a lot to discuss. I want to get your thoughts on the estimates as presented for 2024, 2025 by the Honorable Prime Minister. What are your thoughts? How would you describe this estimate? I think I heard you in Parliament. You gave it a title. I, I'll leave that for you. <laughs> and maybe you can explain to the St. Lucian public why did you choose to describe it as such? And what are some of the things that stood out for you? Okay, let's be fair. What are some of the good things that stood out for you? Maybe we'll look at the negative out after. But are there anything positive that stood out for you in the presentation as presented by the Prime Minister and, and your thoughts on the budget? So first of all, I call the budget a hopeless budget. Okay. And I said that um, I played on the word hopeless in that it was hopelessly put together because it lacked any cohesion. It, uh, there, there was no central theme. Um, there was no the, 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 you didn't see any form of togetherness. It was very disjointed. So it's kind of like bits and pieces here, there, everywhere. I, Nothing is working. It's, and like we spoke about earlier, there was no goal working towards achieving something. It's just bits, pieces. It was patch, patch. Work. Okay. We're like doing the this. Like holes we patch in, in this country? Like how we patch. Uh, hopefully, yeah, exactly the same. So 
The second part is it's hopeless because it offered no hope. Mm -hmm. It had no ambition. Okay? It, it, it wasn't inspirational. Where are we going with this? All right, so the year of infrastructure. Right. Okay? To what end? None of the things. So is healthcare a priority? Yes, but you wouldn't know that. Is national security a priority mm -hmm. in this country? We have 24 murders for the year so far. Absolutely. Right? Um, is education a priority? But you don't get any sense that all these things are tied together to make St. Lucia a better place. Yeah? So, in immediately looking at the budget, the good things are surpluses, um, you know, primary recurrent um, revenue mm -hmm. was good. You saw a, a good An increase. increase in okay? revenue. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at those things initially, without detail, you're going to say, let me celebrate. Right. But when I now understand where we're living and what actually transpired, and then I compare it to the numbers that have come through, okay, it, that's where the worry becomes. So in terms of revenue, I think the government said that they collected extra revenue. And I heard you mention something about the price of fuel and the gas tax. Connect that for me. How is it that the price of fuel has an impact on the increased revenue of the government? So when we did the gas tax initially, the $1.50, we said we're putting it into a lockbox. Okay? Where was the lockbox? The lockbox was in a policy that the government said that two of the four dollars, one fifty was going to go to pay debt financing for the, the, the roads. The roads. So you're saying that you and again it's looking at things not in isolation, but you you looked at let's say I will need a one hundred million dollars this year to to um, construct roads but i can't go to the bank to get a loan of 100 million dollars if i don't have a source of revenue so you instituted a source of revenue which is the dollar 50 and when you calculate a dollar 50 by the amount of fuel that we're consuming per annum you would roughly say okay well i have 40 million dollars that i can from that 150 that i can say to the bank if you give me a loan of 100 million dollars every year i can give you 40 million dollars because i have a dedicated revenue stream for that and the Correct? lock boxes the direct and that's what the lock right. box is And the is director about. of finance knows that. Right. So the director of finance knows. And what did we do? The dollar fifty was sent directly to the, the um, Ministry of Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it generated $30 million. Okay, they had $30 million. Okay, of which they were using it in the first three years, right, to fix up roads, improve the structures, etc. So you saw a lot of work that was taking place. Yes? Right. Because we went and borrowed money for the road redevelopment, but we were given a five-year moratorium. Ah, so then for the first five years, that dollar fifty, you could have used the money for, for other. Okay, so then what happens now? This government came in, and I think they removed the dollar fifty. No. Oh no, they didn't. We don't know. Oh, okay. Okay, because we saw that the price of fuel at the pump, right, went to seventeen dollars. So it was. Thirteen fifty when right. you left government, yes. and we, it went up to seventeen dollars. Seventeen ninety five, I think it made it to. Wow! And it's now down at sixteen fifty. Right. But when you make the comparison, so when the price of of fuel was um, seventy five dollars a barrel mm -hmm. previously, the we were collecting um, the dollar fifty, and we were collecting the two fifty. Okay. So we were collecting literally the four dollars that we had. Mm -hmm. Okay. Today. The government is at seventy-five dollars a barrel, charging sixteen fifty. So it's. I mean, obviously, my one plus one is not so bad. If at thirteen ninety-five and the price on the international market was seventy-five dollars per barrel, you were able to collect four dollars. Then it seems to suggest that with the price still being seventy-five dollars and the price of fuel now being sixteen fifty, it was seventeen dollars for a long time. It seems to suggest that the government may have been collecting more than four dollars. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the question. W the increase in revenue came at the expense of the cost of living. So by keeping the price of fuel above sixteen fifty and collecting more than four dollars and which collecting, you suspect. Right. So you're getting the double whammy there. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at sixteen fifty what happened was is that it caused the price of bus fares 
to go up. Mm-hmm. Okay, the price it cost, of commodities, everything uh, went of up. a whole bunch of commodities went up. So the cost of living went up. So in addition to the inflation in St. Lucia, right, you had added inflation that was being fueled by now tax gouging. So the question we asked, very important question, the revenue, the additional revenue that the government collected, would it have been better in the pockets of the people to help them fight um, the inflation? Or what the, was the government's policy of putting it in their pocket to show a surplus? So, political leader, let me get this straight. You are saying to the St. Lucian people that there were certain things, money-wise, that the government could have done to help either reduce the cost of living, the cost or the increases in some of the prices that we saw, um, by putting certain policies in place, especially with reference to the price of fuel, because we know fuel impacts everything. The cost of fuel impacts transportation, so transportation impacts the cost of goods, etc., etc. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And then it was further um, uh, exasperated by the fact that the, in order to get a loan from CDB and the World Bank, mm-hmm. they had to agree to what they call revenue recovery. So CDB and World Bank said, yes, we can borrow you money, but you need to show that you can collect even more money. Correct. And the government agreed to that. Correct. Now, that's what I'm saying. The tax came first. So when they agreed now, they said, okay, we don't want to increase the VAT because we think that we'll take too much political flack. So they came up with the idea of generating a 2.5% levy for health and security. So they titled it. They disguised it as health and security, but now we're finding out it was because they needed to take the loan. The CDB, World Bank said, listen, I can borrow you money, however you need to show me how you can increase your revenue. And they said, okay, well, we can increase our revenue if we increase certain taxes. And so they put in this tax and they call it health Health and and security. security. Now, we know that this was not true because last year, there was no increase in the allocation to health and security. For sure. So you would have thought if a government came and titled their budget and titled the tax, because that wasn't just the tax, it was mm-hmm. the whole budget was mm-hmm. the year of health and security, yes. and there was no increase in health and security allocation, there's something wrong. So the 2.5%, the government said it would not impact the price of food. That's a lie, because it impacted the cost of doing business. And the business houses had to recover that money by increasing the prices. Well, so, so you have to look at an artificially high price of fuel, which increases the operating cost. Mm-hmm. And also the operating cost, not just for businesses, but also for households. For everybody. For everybody. everybody. You then had the 2.5% that both the businesses were paying as and well and, and everybody else was paying. Okay, Both of those things were generating revenue. So the tax because the government was collecting more than the $4, probably closer to $6 mm-hmm. in revenue. And the 2.5%, we heard, generated seven, $17 million, $17 million mm-hmm. okay, of extra revenue. So when a government can boast that it's increased revenues, it has to be taken into consideration the, the, at the, the sign of the times. Yes. Mm-hmm. You, would, you are still recovering from COVID. Tourism hasn't 100% recovered. Okay, our culture has recovered. The only thing that has recovered back to where we were in 2019 is government's revenue. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Well, we are um, due for a commercial break, um, but we still wanted to speak a little bit about your presentation in Parliament because there were some key issues that you raised with reference to the CIP, to health, and to national security. But we will take... A break right now. I will bring two other guests who's going to discuss some of those other issues in the budget and then afterwards we will now speak to your presentation on CIP health and national security because I think this is very important for the St. Lucian people to understand. 
So St. Lucia, you have been watching the round table hosted by the United Workers Party. And as you saw, I had my guest with me, the leader of opposition and the member of parliament for Mikud South, Honorable Alan Chasne. We've spoken a little bit about the budget process, how it works, how it operates. And I'm hoping that you also understood where and how you cut and the issue of bringing in futuristic um, for futuristic purposes, bringing in outside consultants to assist in preparing the budget. We spoke a little bit about the revenue, the intake, and the increase in revenue. But when we come back and the political leader come back, we're going to speak uh, um, about CIP, health, and national security. But we'll take a break and we'll be right back. This levy will not be imposed on any food items. This means, Mr. Speaker, that the cost of food should not change because of the levy. Philip J. Pierre says that all state funds should go into the Consolidated Fund. Here are some examples of Philip J. Pierre's hypocrisy. As we speak, work on the rehabilitation of the Millennium Highway is ongoing. This project is financed by the Caribbean Development Bank. CDB pays the contractor for the Millennium Highway directly. The funds do not go into the Consolidated Fund. Philip J. Pierre also happens to be the current chairman of CDB. Why aren't the funds going into the consolidated fund if the practice is so unusual as he makes it out to be? Funds from St. Lucia's Citizenship by Investment Program also do not go into the consolidated fund. In 2022, the government of St. Lucia collected a whopping 51 million U.S. from the Citizenship by Investment Program. Not one cent was put into the consolidated fund. What have they done with all this money? Why isn't it going into the consolidated fund? The same contractor that Philip J. Pierre is accusing of facilitating corruption was just awarded a major contract for the new air traffic control tower at Huonora International Airport, and payments will go directly to their account in Panama. In other words, this means that money is not coming into the consolidated fund. Why would a prime minister deliberately spread propaganda and misinformation regarding a practice he follows himself? Why the hypocrisy? What is Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre trying to distract you from? We can't trust Pierre. Welcome back, St. Lucia, and welcome back. You've been viewing the roundtable hosted by the United Workers' Party. And in our first segment, I had my guest, the leader of the opposition and the member of parliament for Mikud South, Honorable Alan Shasni. In this segment, I have with me Senator Dominic Fede, who's the former MP for Ancillary Canaries, and he was also the former Minister of Tourism. He's now a senator um, on behalf of the United Workers' Party. And I also have with me Guy Joseph. He's the Deputy Political Leader of the United Workers' Party, but he has also served as both the Minister of Former Minister of Infrastructure and also a former Minister of Economic Development. And this evening, we will continue the discussion on the estimates of revenue and expenditure. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Nancy. Good to be here. Thank you, um, Nancy. Nice to be here. And pleasant evening to everyone. So... In our first segment, the political leader and I, we had a nice discussion about the budget, the preparation of the budget, what do you cut, what do you put in, etc. And of note is that um, when you look at the estimates as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister. So I will read to you just a few of the departments that we highlighted. Um, so let's take, for example, justice, the Department of Justice. I think justice is responsible for passport and the courts, etc. And I'm saying that in light of the fact that we have this high rate of crime, one would expect that the Department of Justice would pay particular attention to ensure that you had your courts functioning, maybe more magistrates, higher, more judges, etc., etc., um, because a lot of the population feel that they're not getting justice in the courts, and maybe that's why some people are taking justice into their own hands. But the allocation for 23-24 was 26 million, and in this new estimate, it remains the same, 26 million. For 
home affairs and security these used to be um, together but they've separated the two however when you combine the allocation for home affairs and security in the previous year it was 145 million it has gone down to 143 million so they have reduced i want you to note home affairs and security they have reduced it by 2 million whilst we still continue to implement or collect the levy the health and security levy of two and a half percent the department of agriculture from 44 million to 41 <coughs> they have reduced it by 3 million the ministry of commerce have been reduced by 3 million from 19 to 17 infrastructure which i want us to discuss this evening um previously the allocation was 170 million it went down to 122 million a reduction of 48 million and i also decided to look at the capital expenditure because you would appreciate there's recurrent and capital expenditure under that department capital expenditure for 2324 was 117 million and it went down to 68 million in the year that the government has touted the estimates the year of infrastructure and we can look at some orders but equity went down by 18 million and housing went down by 3 million whereas the department of economic development so which is the former department that you were the minister of it went up by 35 million from 105 million to 140 million i want you to share your thoughts i will start with guy joseph that the prime minister and this is the big thing this is the year of infrastructure the prime minister in his estimates made mention of a number of projects i think we are now seeing a new definition of infrastructure as well maybe you can assist me with that because in my mind and maybe in the mind of ordinary St. Lucia, when you heard the year of infrastructure, everybody went, yeah, our roads and our bridges is finally going to be fixed. But I do not think that is the case. Guy, please tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you very much. Um, it is obvious that it's a government that is good on talk, but not on delivery. And the budget is a budget of talking not a budget of working because even the figures you know i said this budget was prepared just like the what they call the roundabout <laughs> by sns the mini roundabouts the the circle oh sorry <laughs> the the cartoon circle that they drew up there on the road that took them three weeks uh -huh. to draw a cartoon circle and then to say the budget is just going around in circles. Oh. We are not going anywhere with this budget. And if a government is going to call it the year of infrastructure, you would think that infrastructure would take center stage and would occupy the bulk of the revenue from the budget. Mm -hmm. But it's easier to say last financial year was the year of infrastructure. Because at least the Ministry of Infrastructure had 172 million. Right. 100 and, yeah, 170 million. 170 they million. They down to 122. And they down to 122. So to reduce a ministry as important as the Ministry of Infrastructure by 48 million in the year of infrastructure tells a story. It is either the Prime Minister has no confidence in the ministry and the minister in his ability to execute the projects. And when you look at the breakdown, because the breakdowns are there, you know, mm -hmm. um, Nancy. For, so if I were, maybe even before, let me highlight. Road expansion repair program. So that is from the Prime Minister's the presentation. The Prime Minister's presentation. Okay, so he's highlighting. School plan rehabilitation. Government plant refurbishment, construction works at St. Jude Hospital. But these are very it, broad, guys. There's no, no specifics. No, when I look at the 30 projects highlighted by the Prime Minister in the year of infrastructure, if you go to any of the constituencies during the last UWP administration, we had this we had more than 30 projects implemented in any financial year. Mm -hmm. and, and it was not a year of infrastructure. And it was not a year of infrastructure. It was a government of infrastructure. Ah. You see, th there's a difference between 
when a government because what did we say we were doing we were building a new St. Lucia we had a five year term of infrastructure projects that was EMAC to reposition St. Lucia as the leading country in the OECS we are now in the backstage we, we are not front row as the, the um, OECS country I mean I'm seeing Antigua is saying within the next five to ten years they expect to be an MDC and what <coughs> more developed country mm -hmm. uh, so, so they, they're removing themselves from the category of LDC while under our present government we are going backwards so all what the for a prime minister in the year of infrastructure to highlight repairs to schools but repairs to schools is an ongoing rehabilitation works refurbishment of government i mean and i think when when you look at some of the projects guy in my <coughs> mind i think the prime minister was more or less fishing because when you look i i i decided to look at some of the projects as well and recognize i think out of is it 30 projects that he has approximately 21 of those projects were projects that were started some of them even by the previous administration they've been ongoing but yet still the prime minister has highlighted them but, in his year of infrastructure but, but let's look at it rehabilitation of rudy john beach park you go in and repair a little facility a little beach facility <laughs> and you put this on as a major project how many years ago was was the the um rudy john park bill but let me ask you a question before i go on to dominic who i think is itching to join into the discussion when we talk about infrastructure or when you had a word infrastructure what comes to mind is it rooted things like rudy john beach park or like the market or some of the things that i'm hearing or what is it that comes to mind and you've been a former was it communication and works under you and then changed yes. to infrastructure yes. All right, so it was changed from communication and works to infrastructure, I suppose, for a reason. What comes to mind and why do we have all these projects all over the place being spoken of as the year of infrastructure? I think the Prime Minister wanted to say something that was not real. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when a government will present in a budget recon and rehab, blocking a pothole on a road, you, you put that in your budget speech, it means your budget is empty. <laughs> if, if I have an hour or two hours to speak in parliament, I can't speak about patching a road or building a small retaining wall. Because that's wall. normal day-to-day -day operations. That's, that's what I'm saying, Nancy. So, so when I see um, completion of Custer this week, you're building four cells in castries and you put that as a major project in the year of infrastructure, and the thing is almost done. Then, then you have, you have things like Caldesac Community Center. You know, these are things for individual ministers mm -hmm. when they make their budget presentation to come and speak about what they will endeavor to do in their various communities so these are community, and constituencies. Community projects, not but you expect a prime minister coming and speak about infrastructure to talk about the major development projects on the island. So the time the prime minister took to do that, he should have explained to us why they said St. Jude would be finished in two and a half years if they had continued with what we were doing. And now it's three years later and work has not even really commenced at St. Jude. Well, we will get back to St. Jude's. I do want to get back to St. Jude's because we have an allocation. Thing, the airport. Mm -hmm. You found an airport under construction. You stopped it and you start a terminal building. Now think of it. The terminal, not, not no, the, the terminal, tower. The, the tower. tower. The tower is to house the three or four people who work. Now if flights can come in. Why you need a tower? If your airport cannot increase its accommodation of passengers, the tower almost becomes useless because the tower that was there has served us. So if there's no capacity to grow, why? But this is what the prime minister has highlighted. When a prime minister will highlight 
recon and rehab of bridges and culverts <laughs> and i go into the estimates of revenue and expenditure and i see five hundred thousand dollars for bridges and culverts for the whole no island century. but before we get to Th that this guy. is not for a community you know under the UWP administration, we were spending $2 million in Castries Southeast alone, alone. in the Silton. Well, let me get to Dominic because we do have a lot on the infrastructure and economic development that we want to talk about. But Senator Fede, tourism, it's a hotly debated topic. I did not find that the Prime Minister spoke a lot about tourism in his um, budget presentation, but in the estimates, perhaps you can take us through the numbers, and maybe you can highlight some of the key um, strategies, I don't know if there are, or what is happening within the tourism sector, because tourism is very critical to our economy, notwithstanding that the Prime Minister said that he did not understand the impact or the importance of tourism, and notwithstanding the fact that he did everything to discourage the previous administration during COVID, when we tried to reopen the country, and we will get into the point where we recognize, or oh, well, our Prime Minister at the time recognized the importance of tourism and that no matter what happened, you would have rebounded on tourism. The Labour Party did not see that vision, but today they are benefiting from that vision. So tell us a bit more about what is in the estimates with reference to tourism. Well, Nancy, um, not anything that's new, not anything that I could say, wow, that these guys are going to um, take this misfortune. You know, St. Lucia right now is underperforming. Okay. Um, when we look at how the rest of the Caribbean have recovered, they have recovered a lot stronger than St. Lucia. So CTO, they have just put out their report suggesting that um, 11 destinations have got back to their pre-COVID um, numbers. St. Lucia is not one of them. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? If Jamaica can, if Guyana can, if Anguilla, if um, St. Vincent, Grenada, and all of these countries can say, look, we have surpassed where we were before COVID. St. Lucia is not in that position. The last report from the Tourism Authority said this, that St. Lucia is 250,000 visitors short of where it was 2019 overall. Why I start with the arrivals, Nancy, mm -hmm. is because if we're going to do a, a village tourism project and we're going to give grants and loans uh, to get uh, small business people into uh, ancillary services, whether it's stores or taxis or um, or whether it's restaurants, they need to have people coming to patronize those Because if you, if, if you build it and they don't come, then you're at a loss. It's, it's, it, it, it's pointless. It's absolutely so pointless. So you're saying the priority of the, of the government should be ensuring that you can get the visitors to come. So you need to do a well, two-pronged well, approach? Well, I'm, I'm saying that you need to do both. You both. need to get um, small businesses involved as we were doing with the village tourism program. We started, as you know, with um, Groselay, Ancillary, Soufra, and we as well started with Viewfort. And it's unfortunate for me that that project um, could not have gotten off the ground and it was stifled since but, this administration But I see in. In, in the budget, Senator Fede, community tourism, an allocation of only $3 million. I yeah, mean, so how far does that go for the extent of so by the time you build the Morn Lay-By, that's gone. Oh. That's finished. Yeah? Three million dollars. Three million dollars to get the infrastructure of this country going in community tourism is absolutely no money. So, um, so what is left then for small community people who want to invest in, in the community to benefit from the, the, the t community tourism Well, project. I notice a lot of leftover projects from the UWP administration. Okay. So Tell us I'm very happy to see that the government has started the Box Park, for mm -hmm. example, in the market. That's the, where the whole, for St. Lucians watching, the location of the old marketing board building right. facing Massey stores. So that, that big project, building that is being constructed there is what? That's under the OECS Competitive Tourism Project. And what it is really, um, you know, I must thank the former Prime Minister and Minister of Finance um, who had the foresight to say, look, um, look at the harbor, look at the cruise area. It's the most important piece of real estate in Castries, but yet it underperforms as an economic activity. There's so much more opportunity to get small people into businesses, um, to raise the whole profile of the market and turn the entire area into a better economic opportunity for small and medium-sized businesses. And so that box park, there are about 20 shops in there, mm -hmm. which will now give people the opportunity to present their products 
in a more attractive way to the cruise ship passengers. So you're creating more economic space for... More for economic them. opportunities. St. Lucia has a disembarkation rate. 95% of the people that come on the cruises get off. Okay. But they spend less than a third of their time on shore as an average. So 95% come off, we intrigue them, mm -hmm. they come to the market, but out of that 95 that get off, and, uh, about a third or so go on tours and attractions mm -hmm. in Sufer and other communities, but two-thirds go back on the ship, and that is because we don't do There's a very good job right. in Castry. So it is very urgent, and I was looking forward that the year of infrastructure would have spoken ab about upgrading the waterfront in a meaningful way so that we can make our port, we can make it more attractive, we can give our vendors more opportunity to, to sell stuff, we can create more businesses for new entrants into the small business sector uh, to profit from the cruise industry, we can give our taxi drivers, there are guys who are there on that peg by the arcade and they, they do nothing for the day. For the entire day. Because the business is not there, it's not coming, it's not filtering down. So that is the issue we need to get these guys going. The guys that are renting their chairs um, at on Pigeon Island, mm -hmm. on Rodney Bay, uh, in the area of um, Vigi Beach as well, those are all positive stuff. But you go talk to them and ask them what's business like. And you will get the, the, the shoddy stories. So we have to make sure that we're getting the arrivals, so, we have so the numbers coming in so that people can get business. Tell me, how do you get people to come to St. Lucia? So if it is so important that you get the people to come, if you have the infrastructure but you do not have the people to participate and you need to bring people in, tell me how do you get people to come? And I, I went through the budget, maybe you can help me in identifying where is that allocation or where is it that project that will create or make it possible for more people to come how do you as a former minister of tourism how do you get people to come to your destination well you have to market your destination create the awareness because there are a lot of destinations fighting for the business and competing right but then as well you need to make sure that you have connectivity with flights mm -hmm. right that's where this administration they have lagged behind um last year nancy we lost about 13 flights a week in the summer we had the most dismal summer um, in the history of the country. 13 flights we lost. Yeah. But I've been reading, Senator Fede, most countries, even of late, I saw from Antigua and even Jamaica, they've had increased flights coming into those countries from American Airlines and I think from JetBlue as well. And I've not been seeing anything like that with reference to St. Lucia. So That's why in the performance we could see that 11 of the CTO countries are back to their pre-COVID numbers. They're pre-COVID and, and St. Lucia, and Saint Lucia is. is not. So in our hotel occupancies, we are significantly below where we were. In fact, in August of um, 2023, we had a 20% decline in our biggest market. We have markets like the UK and, um, and so on decline significantly by as much as 35%. It's a, it's a huge number. But the minister, what he's doing, He's going to tell people that the recovery is strong and the growth is strong. Because what he's doing, Nancy, is using um, the, the year, is, is using recovery and painting recovery as growth. Yeah, I think I, I, think I heard you giving that sort of explanation and perhaps maybe you can clarify a little bit more because there's a difference you were saying that there's a difference with growth and recovery and the suggestion you were saying is um that we're at recovery stage or not necessarily growth stage but the minister or the government is purporting it that we are growing in tourism whereas we have not reached the pre-COVID level, which is 2019 figures, and they're claiming it's growth, but in your opinion, it's recovery. Explain that, just... So if 100 people came last year, and um, let's say this year, uh, because of COVID, 80 people came. Right. Now, next year, when I'm calculating the comparison between the 80, if I grew by 10%, it means that all I have to do is add 8 individuals, and mm -hmm. I can say I, I grew by 10%. 
Yeah. But you still but did not grow. That's only 88 people. Not, and I'm not the back 100. to the 100. Okay. So we're still recovering, but we have not grown. So St. Lucia, I think it's very easy what the, mini the, the former minister is saying that we've been on a recovery path and not necessarily on a growth path because we're still not at the level that we were pre COVID. Um, and what do you think that the government is doing wrong? Before I get back to um, Guy Joseph so we can speak a little bit more about infrastructure, what do you think that the government is doing wrong in terms of bringing people to this country? They don't have a good marketing plan and they don't have a good airlift strategy. Two very simple things. So you need they to need market to, it? They need to be a lot more aggressive, go to the cruise um, executives to make sure that those relationships are tight so that um, St. Lucia is prioritizing the schedules for the cruise ships. Those three things are, are very important. They've got to fix crime and other things as well to give the uh, travel community confidence mm -hmm. that St. Lucia is going to be among one of the safest places to send your visitors. Don't think that the crime situation is not having a knock-on effect on people's confidence to travel to the destination. When people are doing their research and they go on the internet and they see all these bad stories of these unprecedented levels of homicides, that can't help tourism. And this government must now fix this as if our life depend on it because they, what, 40, 50 percent of our economy relies on this being sorted out. If we can't fix this, Nancy, I think that um, the stakes are too high. We could lose a lot. Okay, well, let's get back to Guy Joseph in terms of infrastructure. Guy, um, my information is two things I want to ask you about. My information, St. Jude's, I really want to talk about St. Jude's because I think there is a big number there that I just could not understand. And when I saw it, I thought to myself, okay, what is this about? And also, um, in terms of the capital expenditure of the ministry, they have highlighted there's um, what are some of the key infrastructure projects that they will be undertaken in terms of infrastructure. So let's talk about St. Jude's first. I saw a big number there. Tell me what is that number about and what is going on with St. Jude's? I, I think um, the numbers I saw in the budget for St. Jude is somewhere in the region of 265 million. Yes, that's what I saw. The, the, the total cost of St. Jude's, the total project cost is $265 million. Now, don't you think, and, and that is why I said initially in my discussion, don't you think that the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance owes the people of St. Lucia an explanation? And he may say, yes, I will do it um, in, in the um, policy, policy debate. Mm -hmm. But when you give figures and you want people to vote in the parliament on the figures, they ought to at least have a basic idea. So is the true cost of completing St. Jude now 265 million? And if the borrowing from the Saudis was only 205 million and a portion of it is to go to the stadium, then is it? A situation where Renault has done maybe a $65 million worth of work at the stadium that he is to be paid so, for. So, so before you, you're the running Saudis too fast. Running too no, fast. No. Let's, let's stop. But $265 million, the, the estimate is saying this is the project cost, and we borrowed so far. 205 millions from the Saudi, so there's a shortfall of 60. So we still have to borrow, you saying we still have to borrow that 60, whether it be bonds or well, bonds, the prime, loans. Or th that is why I'm saying the prime minister, in coming and present a budget in the year of infrastructure, that is why I said you cannot talk about potholing as the year of infrastructure. You allow the roads to get bad. You allow crater-like holes to be formed in the roads for you to come and repair tomorrow and say that's the year of infrastructure. That's how you're creating work in the country, by allowing things that can be repaired overnight and, and then allowing it to be that way. So, so the prime minister owes the country an explanation mm -hmm. about the real cost of St. Jude because this is the same government that said... $5 million, and John Peters said it, <laughs> 5 to $20 million, and he was part of the team. Um, the member for Labry said, um, some chemical 
and some paint, and that's what St. Jude needed. I, uh, let's say that would cost a million dollars. Now we are seeing a figure, and the Prime Minister kept on saying he does not have the figures for St. Jude. So does he have it now? Is that why it is reflected in the budget that 265 million is needed? And the UWP government kept on saying it was cheaper and easier to build a new hospital than to finish the old St. Jude. If you look at the numbers, I think this thing is going to bring additional frustration to the people of St. Lucia to say well, well, that we will be spending an additional $264 million on that old structure. Whereas I think under the United Workers Party, when the government came in, they would not have even had to spend over $150 million to finish the new structure. So well, where's well, the sense well, in has, that? I'm not even concerned about that part of it, Nancy. I'm more concerned about the timing of the completion of St. Jude. Okay. Because out of the $265 million that the budget um, estimates mention, it looks like it's only about $65 million that is going to be spent based on the estimates of revenue and expenditure. For this year. For this year. And we are talking about the financial year, which begins April 1st, 2024, to March 31st, 2025. So is it safe to say that St. Jude's will not be completed within this financial well, year because of the Well, it means allocation. that the expenditure would be less than one-third of what is required to finish St. Jude. So, so obvious... Well, that raises the question, is it just the old St. Jude's? Or are they also going to spend money on the attempt by the United Workers' Party? Well, what we, know, what, okay. what we mm -hmm. know for a fact is that they are using the dialysis and the physiotherapy building. But these and, two buildings have been completed. Yes. So, so that's what I'm saying. Is the government hiding some information in the overall figures? Because... They said there's no contract at St. Jude. There's work that has been going on. And we are hearing questionable things about the method of contract selection. But the, the Prime Minister Sticker Pin in his budget statement indicated that $17 million in the last financial year was spent on St. Jude's. So what do you think about and that my, inf Where? my information was that nobody in any of the ministries was willing to sign off on the contract that reno had there or if he had a contract if he was working by the day or by the hour but how did the prime and minister come up with that figure then no that that is a, a figure that is correct okay based on the claims that are in ah, the ministry ah. but nobody had signed off on it as the last conversation that we had about St. Jude. Because the government must understand that people, they are public servants who see what is happening, who understand what is happening, and if they put their signature to paper on works that they did not supervise, what is going to happen? That, that's why I love the idea of the special prosecutor, you know. Because the special prosecutor will be used in due course to be able to rectify, and, and that is why when I look, I support my political leader in saying this is a hopeless yes, budget. budget. When a prime minister can resolve to talking about the repairs to the Rudy John Park as a major infrastructure project of a government in the year of infrastructure, this tells me everything I need to do. I build new parks. I build brand new facilities. That was not even highlighted in a budget. The Prime Minister found the time and the space in his budget to talk about the repair of a school for $500,000 so as the major infrastructure project in the year of infrastructure. And the last thing I'll tell you, Nancy, mm -hmm. on this. It is obvious that the Prime Minister did not trust his minister well, I was to come to and that. speak about the projects of implementation. 
So it's, I suspect that Stevenson King has lost favor in his achievements or his accomplishments as the Minister of Infrastructure. And look at it. We have two Prime Ministers who are two Ministers of Infrastructure and in the year of infrastructure. You've reduced if the, the if infrastructure the SNS budget. roundabout is anything for me to go by on the basis of what infrastructure is in St. Lucia, then I know we are in serious trouble. And that is why I agree this is a hopeless budget. budget. Let's go back to Dominic quickly because we're running out of time. Jazz, carnival, and some of those activities surrounding um, tourism. Tell us a bit more about it because I, I don't understand. I see an allocation um, for... Um, but tell us how is jazz finance because I've not been able to find it in the budget if you can perhaps clarify to us So why there's an eight million dollars. That's under the marketing services. That's right. So the minister said in his uh, debate of the estimates that um, That's actually coming from the consolidated fund to help mm -hmm. them with the jazz festival So, so I presume eight million that dollars for jazz at least eight million but um, Nancy, when we came in 2016, the Jazz Festival, they were paying as much as $14 million oh, wow. for the Jazz Festival. That's what you now, inherited. I know that the people of St. Lucia, they love to get these complimentary tickets and to go to jazz and people like to go have fun. But the objective that is stated in the budget is this is for marketing the destination. We have to ask ourselves whether we're going to get 14 million dollars or 12 million or whatever the cost is is for the labor party to come and tell us whether the 12 or 10 or 15 or whatever they're spending whether we get that amount of money so in there, marketing is, value let me ask you a question the is, there, is there any report or anything that is being prepared Nothing. after jazz to show we spent 12 million dollars and these are the number of visitors we got for that period because i as i understood it jazz was created for during the lull in the season and it was an activity that would have allowed for visitors to come in so there's is, is there nothing to show for that how do we know or understand the impact of jazz well, what we know from doing it for 30 years is that the Caribbean um, is the big market. You get a lot of diaspora people coming from the UK and the US, and then you have a good captive audience from the Caribbean as well. Now, with the airlift situation in the Caribbean, in a flux, do you think that people can access the festival like they did in the years gone, gone by? The answer is no. So, we know then that this is just a big national party we know then that this is just a, a, a slush fund for the, for the government and its friends um, so that they can give away free tickets. Look, so do you think the money year, could be better spent on airlift and marketing in the international market instead of... of well, of absolutely. And that is the point that we've been making is that we're not against people going and having a good time at Pigeon Island, but we have to understand what this does to the marketing budget. That's why we're so weak because we weaken our marketing budget. We don't have a lot of money left to go and spend on television advertising. We need to put money into uh, a lot more social media so that in the UK, uh, in the US, people can see St. Lucia, people can access the information, people can see the specials, uh, see all the beautiful sites and attractions that we have. If we're gonna develop community tourism, mm -hmm. and I'm coining their phrase, um, if we're gonna develop village or community tourism, then Nancy, we need to give the small businesses, which is in this bigger destination, the, the most fighting chance. And if you don't promote the destination, then how are people gonna get to these small restaurants and these small uh, boutiques mm -hmm. and shops mm -hmm. and the vendors and so all the small key. businesses? I mean, I see, um, I saw, for example, some of the tours, for example. How do people get to them if you don't promote the destination? Mm -hmm. And so when you do the jazz festival, just for your ego, to say, well, we did it big and we were bad. Mm -hmm. UWP stopped it and we brought it back. Correct. I think that's the narrative. Right. That's, it's all politics. So I, I think that $15 million is too much of a price that you pay 
for people to score political victories. And so, and who are suffering? Nancy, in the summer period, and it's going to be tough this summer when the airlines um, change their schedules mm -hmm. and we have um, less flights. You're going to have hotel employees getting less hours in the hotels. So they're this means less off. pay. Mm -hmm. But just imagine that you're a single mother working in the hotel. Your bills haven't necessarily changed. And in fact, your, your bills are getting higher with the way that things are going now with this inflation crisis. So it is important that we stabilize the summer, that we make use of the awards that we get um, as the world's leading honeymoon destination. If you are the world's leading honeymoon destination, then a big time that people, for the wedding industry and for the honeymoon season, is the, is the spring and the mm -hmm. summer. But we don't have flights in the spring and the summer. Ah. So when they go to parliament and they boast that St. Lucia for 15 years in a row, got the world's leading honeymoon destination um it is something that we can't utilize or maximize properly because we haven't fixed the flight problem that well we, we are running out of time um and i just wanted you to wrap up and guy i'll come to you as well to wrap up in terms of infrastructure before we take a break to our next segment so your final thoughts on the estimates and the impact of it on tourism and where we're at just in 30 seconds um, I think that this is a disservice to tourism. I haven't seen anything here that's going to change the game. We have a long way to go. We're underperforming. Our recovery is slower than um, the rest of our Caribbean neighbors. I envy that, and I, I hope that this government um, gets the point. Uh, I, I, I can't see how this is going to help the small um, people the small in the country. Mm -hmm. Guy? Um, you said there was a lack of confidence because the Prime Minister took out $48 million from infrastructure and he put it under his own ministry, which is economic development. Your final thoughts in terms of the year of infrastructure and the move by the Prime Minister, what do you think that means in less than a minute? So what, what we see there is an obvious lack of confidence in the ability of the Ministry of Infrastructure and I think that before the Prime Minister had announced the year of infrastructure, he should have fixed the Ministry of Infrastructure. <laughs> because um, you cannot have a Ministry of Infrastructure that need fixing itself, and then you call it the year of infrastructure. And then you remove the money from it as <laughs> and well. And then you remove the money. I mean, it's a situation that's not very helpful. Now, I want to highlight one line to show you how hopeless this budget is. On page 17, it says, Mr. Speaker, there will be something for everyone in this budget as we improve our infrastructure. Citizens can look forward to better roads, safer school plan, housing opportunities, increased support for the poor and vulnerable members of our society. Now, I can leave all the rest and just take increased support for our poor and vulnerable the budget was reduced yet by still million the budget the department that is responsible for the poor and the vulnerable the ministry of equity equity it was cut by 18 million it was dollars. cut by 18 million the ministry of consumer affairs was cut by three million, three million. now i believe that is why they created the sugar shortage so that they can cut the subsidy of sugar by $3 million and increase the price of sugar. So it is obvious to me that the poor and vulnerable in this country will suffer the most under this budget, and it is indeed a hopeless situation for St. Lucia. We know that the Ministry of Infrastructure is not in the equation, and I will say it again. If the roundabout they built is anything to go by to measure what the value or the worth of the Ministry of Infrastructure, you know what I said it is? You see these cartoon characters where you draw things and then it become a life? That is exactly what this circle is. A drawing that you have no choice but to drive over. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. There you have it, St. Lucia. We've had a summary of the Department of Infrastructure and a summary of the Department of Tourism. And again, we're saying to you that the Prime Minister says one thing in the statement because he gave a speech, you heard him, but when you look at the numbers, the numbers tell a different story. We're due for another commercial break, but when we come back, I'm going to bring back the 
leader of the opposition and the political leader and another very special guest where we're going to look at the economy we're going to speak about debt we're going to speak about growth it's a lot of these things that have been pounded about all over the place and i think i want you to get a greater appreciation of what it is and what it means so stay tuned and we will be right back this levy will not be imposed on any food items this means mr speaker that the cost of food should not change because of the levy Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre claims that no other CARICOM countries have received funds from Saudi Arabia and that the US$75 million United States dollars loan that he has taken for St. Jude was because of his government's hard work. Here is the truth. Antigua has received US$80 million US, Guyana has received US$150 million US, Grenada has received US$100 million US, Belize has received US$77 million US, Bahamas has received $12 million US and St. Vincent received $10 million. We can't trust Pierre. Good evening and welcome back St. Lucia to the round table where we're having a feisty discussion on the estimates of revenue and expenditure for 2024-2025. You've heard initially from the political leader of the United Workers Party and the leader of the opposition. You also heard from two former government ministers on tourism, Senator Dominic Fede, and infrastructure, Guy Joseph. Now we're here for our final segment, and we've brought back to you our leader of the opposition and the political leader, member of parliament for Mikud South, Honorable Alan Chasney. And I have with me a very special guest, Mr. Frank Myers, who's a chartered accountant. I thought that we needed to bring some non-political biases. So in case you think that Alan Chasney, Guy Joseph, and Dominic Fede is just talking from a political point of view, we wanted to bring in somebody with some area of expertise in finance to at least look at the estimates of revenue of an expenditure and give you his honest opinion about it so welcome frank and welcome back political leader Great to be here. before we took our break um mr chasney we wanted to look briefly at cip and also the health and national security because we have a two and a half percent levy that the prime minister indicated that he had co collected i think is it 17 million dollars and the the budget for this year he's estimated that he wants to collect 35 million dollars i want you to give us a brief synopsis maybe based on also the prime minister's statement because he did give a breakdown and in this year's budget because we we are always of the opinion that this health and security levy, notwithstanding we now have the evidence from the loan that it was never about health and security, but also in the estimates, both last year and I think this year's estimates, when you look at it, the allocation to health and security does not tie in with the revenue that the government is estimating to collect for the health and security. So let's start with health and security first and then we'll go to CIP. Tell us what is it we can see in the estimates with reference to that tax and the um, health and security. Well, it's exactly what you said. I mean, last year, um, when they made this big song and dance about the health and security levy, I think that everybody, including ourselves, were shocked to see that there actually was zero increase in the allocation for health and security. Um, you, they've had a whole year to rectify the situation. They've decided to keep the tax on. They've explained how much money has been collected. Yet, uh, once again, there is no substantial increase in um, health and security. If we look at security, we now have three ministers, a fact that the Prime Minister tried to deny. Mm -hmm. You have uh, the Minister of Home Affairs right. and the Ministry of Home Affairs. You have the Minister of National Security himself. And now you have a new minister which is the Minister for, for Crime, for crime prevention. prevention. Prevention, okay. Right? So the cost of gone, has gone up. I think three people becomes incredibly dysfunctional. It was dysfunctional at two. I think it's going to even be more dysfunctional at three. Um, and particularly considering the Prime Minister says um, that things are going to improve, but he doesn't want to be hands-on. And there's no increase in the allocation. In fact, there was a reduction 
in the amount of, of national security, if I'm not mistaken, by two or three million dollars. Two million dollars. So health and security, it was 145. It went down to 143. Right. So there's a reduction of two million dollars, and health. It went up by five million dollars, but when you look at the numbers, the five million dollars is allocated to St. Jude's and not necessarily to anything within the ministry. Well, what's interesting, and again, we have seen a pattern of behavior with this government um, that what they say is not actually what happens. We've seen it with the health and security tax, we've seen it with HIA, we've seen it with the Rodney Bay Road, we've seen it with St. Jude's. Remember what they said, they, that you needed some uh, uh, chemical, chemical and some paint um, and $10 million and, and three months that we could have moved into the old hospital. Today now you hear a number of $265 million. I really want that to sink in. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. That, and let's put it in perspective. Mm -hmm. We started a brand new building that's 210 thousand square feet so it's bigger by 20 percent than okeu right right and that building as you see it there to date we've spent 140 million dollars on it so the building is 20 percent bigger than okeu which right. is the new the new structure that we built right. the structure that kenny anthony called the box and everybody wants to refer to as that Correct. and we spent 140 million dollars on a new structure right and, 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 they, and they, they, they've admitted $75 million, right, to finish it. But that $75 million included $25 million that was owed to the contractor on work that was already done. So, so it's it's essentially it's 50. $50 million, okay. Our person said it would take six months. Let's just say a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, you would have already been in on the ground floor to the place. But you're going to turn around to D and... spend $265 million on a building that you still cannot even show any designs for. United Workers Party was constantly showing people what the final outcome was going to be of the building. While we were building it, we were working with Cayman Health City to train the staff from St. Jude's to move into a modern facility. Because it's not the old facility, mm -hmm. not a stadium anymore, a modern facility. We put in mechanisms to pay for the hotel, for the start for the for the hospital. So what are we doing? Upstairs was going to be an international hospital. So it meant that the X-ray machines, the MRI machines, the lab, the maintenance would have all been shared cost. And not the, the health insurance as well, because persons would now I, I, you wouldn't I, go and accumulate a bill. You'd now have health insurance. So the health insurance, the health insurance is a different issue, but it's an important issue for us to understand. Mm -hmm. the, this government has been in for three, three years. Three years. They're proposing universal health, mm -hmm. which is basically government's going to pay for the health. Mm -hmm. How does a government that's in deficit do that? Well, I want to stick a pin because when you looked at on the UHC, the allocation was only $1.8 million, just so St. Lucians know. I think it was an increase of about $500,000. So nothing significant is going to happen so, in UHC. So let's look, at, let's look at the number. Mm -hmm. What we said, and we were working actually with um, NIC, so Frank would have been familiar with the discussions that we were having. Mm -hmm was to run a health insurance. And how does health insurance work? Health insurance would have worked that every single St. Lucian would have been required to have health care insurance. Okay? Mm -hmm. The government would pay for the persons who are retired and their pensions were below a certain amount. Right. So government would pay the $1,000 for them. Mm -hmm. The government would pay for people who are unemployed. Right. The single mothers who have never had a job and have to take care of their the families. The people who are on the pauper's list, for pauper's example. Pauper's list. The government, government would pay, pay that. for that. Okay? The persons who are working, they would now share the cost with their, their, their companies. Their employees. Just like so, NIC. Yeah. Okay? So in this case, it could be that they pay 50-50. So you pay $500 a year. A year. Mm -hmm. Right? So but what's that? But you're covered. Right? But that's how much a month? Right? Less than $40 a month mm -hmm. towards health insurance. But it means that the government, not the government, a fund would have, an insurance fund would have collected 
80 million dollars a year in revenue which would only go towards the operating cost pay for your medicine um, to pay for operations mm -hmm. to pay for dialysis but the salaries of the of the workers the, the nurses the doctors would be we paid for by, be covered by government and the utilities so here it is we've we recognize government is not in the financial position to cover the cost by itself and what's great about this is that every single person in order to qualify for the health insurance had to get a doctor's checkup mm -hmm. okay so we were working with the taiwanese so so it was almost like it's a, like we said in the initially when we had the previous discussion you are never thinking about today and now you always thinking about the future so when you look at all these things and you tie all these things in terms of healthcare um, and, and, and insurance and St. Jude's and Cayman Health City, you've always think, been thinking about the future and where do we go from here and what do you want to achieve. So it's always working towards so the even, So even as a political party, mm -hmm. established in the mission, the mission of the party says affordable, affordable quality, quality healthcare. healthcare. So we feel as a political party, affordable health, uh, uh, affordable um, uh, quality, uh, quality health care we felt that uh, internationally competitive education system, mm -hmm. we felt security, regardless of where you live in St. Lucia, you we should feel safe, secure. and then economic opportunity. So create the, 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 the infrastructural environment, both physical and socially, to allow people to prosper and compete and to earn their own income, yeah? So this budget is scary because the government is attempting to use people's desire for health and security against them mm -hmm. by holding up a promise of which when you look inside there's no ability of them delivering that promise this is not sustainable and when people go to the hospitals right now they see it for themselves mm -hmm. and the government is living in denial as to what is actually happening on the ground Nancy and it is a catastrophe and it's it's a shame it's disgraceful it's disingenuous it's dishonest for this government to say to people we're prioritizing this but they cannot show In any the details estimates, the numbers right the numbers mm -hmm. don't support the story that's being told well let's go to cip very quickly and then we'll get on to frank in terms of his thoughts on the estimates and some of the numbers and i think we also want to speak a little bit about the loan um guarantee for national lotteries which has been something that we've been discussing for a while as well i also want to get his thoughts on that tell us a little bit about cip because the prime minister made certain <coughs> statements i think if you want to just read that sentence or paragraph in terms of cip and break it down for us in terms of what does it mean so it says that mr speaker the reason for the difference between the approved estimates and the projected outturn for 23-24 so in in um the, there was a projection as to how much money CIP was going to earn. Okay. They had projected that CIP was going to earn $90 million. Okay. Okay? And that $90 million was supposed to go into the economic fund. All right. Okay? But only $45 million was earned. Okay. Instead of the 90. Right. Okay? So, um, is due to an increase in demand for the real estate option rather than the donations that go directly into the National Economic Fund. So stick up in there mm -hmm. and explain to us what is the real estate option and what is the, what is the other one? The economic fund. The economic, the, the, donation. the donations. So St. Lucians, I think we're still a little bit confused about the CIP, how does it work? So there's a donation component and there's a real estate component. Tell us what is the donations first. So there's actually three, but, I'll, but I'm going to tell you. Let's stick to those two for now based right. on what he says. So the real estate option is there's only one real estate company identified in solution, which is Galaxy. Mm -hmm. So Galaxy goes out and um, uh, gets a contribution of $200,000. Okay, towards their 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 projects. So Galaxy is authorized to sell our passports. Yes. At two hundred thousand dollars. Yes. And when let's say I am the one who's purchasing the passport, when yes. Galaxy approaches yes. me yes. and I give the two hundred thousand, that's US dollars. Yes. I give it to Galaxy. Correct. And what happens then? Um, that money goes into the development. The person gets ownership 
in the hotel. So Galaxy is building a hotel. Yes. So when I make my investment of two hundred thousand dollars, yes. I am investing in Galaxy's hotel that yes. is building in Saint Lucia. Yes. And I get a percentage of ownership based on that money. And you get your citizenship. Uh, and I get citizenship. So what is the benefit to the country in that option? So it was a program that was really started um, by Saint Kitts um, to help get new investments so the the, the, ah. the perspective is you're going to get a hotel there's going to generate jobs and employment okay taxes etc okay all right and the government collects fees on that as well on that as well on the two hundred thousand dollars when i make the investment yeah. there's a fee that the government gets Correct. and galaxy gets the money okay Correct. okay we understand that so the donations is what so the donation is a hundred thousand that i so just i can buy just a passport okay i make a donation to the government of san lucia of a hundred thousand dollars and 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 in true sense of the word it's a donation i don't get that money back correct that money goes directly to the government who then puts it into the economic fund okay okay the third option is the bonds mm -hmm. so i can i can pay two hundred and fifty thousand dollars right um i it's treated as a bond i pay you no interest for five years mm -hmm. and in five years time i, I pay just give you back your money? Your, your money okay when you calculate the, what the interest is it comes to the hundred thousand dollars right so that is where instead of me going out on the market in terms of bonds and paying interest you would give me that money right. i pay no interest to you and i can use the money reinvest it or do whatever i have to do and make sure in five years time i have money to give you back correct your, your, so what so. the prime minister has said here mm -hmm. is that the um real estate option did better than the donations than the donations more person so hold on can i ask a question a thought just a good sure does it mean that galaxy was better at promoting their project than the government was at promoting the donation aspect and that's why galaxy made more money than the government that's that's what the suggestion is okay okay but there are rumors that are out in the marketplace um that galaxy has been selling the CIP program for less than the two hundred thousand dollars. Ah, so maybe that's why it's if if it's cheaper. It, let's look at it from my perspective. I'm a potential investor. Correct. I have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but I can get it for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I can get the option of having ownership in a hotel. Correct. I get my passport. Correct. Um, that's a better option than just giving government free money and getting a passport. Correct. Because I get something for that passport. In addition to getting a passport, I get a percentage of shares in a hotel. Right. If I give government my hundred thousand dollars, I get nothing, just a passport. So obviously, it's 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 night and day. Correct. Now, there has been um, uh, indication that the private sector's confidence in St. Lucia, right, is not as strong as it used to be before. And that is manifested in the demand for bonds. So what he then goes on and says, mm -hmm. in addition, 39 or $40 million was received from bonds, but it included the bond financing this year. So of the $80 million that was raised for bonds, mm -hmm. half of it came from, from, the C CIP. from CIP, wow. not from the market. Okay, so that's another very interesting interesting that is something i would want you to come back and talk about a little bit later in terms of government raising revenue how is it possible that you raise more revenue from the cip bonds than on the market so right. this is something about the confidence of investors in the government on so, the market so what's also interesting right is that we must understand the economic fund mm -hmm. right so the economic fund was established and it was protected how is it protected? So cabinet, um, a cabinet conclusion and by legislation created the economic fund. Appoints the board of directors, the director of finance, I mm -hmm. think the director of budget, um, there's a private sector person on, and government only gave it a policy directive. But that was your government. Yes, so right. we gave it a policy directive. The policy directive was that they could only use the money to either pay off government debt or for capital projects. And that has changed. It could not be used for recurrent expenditure mm -hmm. because we wanted, now the key was that we wanted it to be built up as a sovereign fund. So it means that we wanted to build up like three or 4% of our GDP would be in cash reserve. Why? If in fact you had another COVID, 
you had a earthquake you had instead of having hurricane. to borrow the money like we did last time we could we can draw it on on our reserve mm -hmm. so it's like having a savings account yep. right like you would have in your household for a rainy day, for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. okay government needs to do the same thing so we don't have that now and that oh, no, has no, changed no, no, no. no it's worse than that okay within three weeks of getting into government the government changed the rules mm -hmm. and said any project approved by cabinet so the economic fund no longer had that sovereign to see to determine how the funds were going to be used cabinet would now determine how those funds were going to be used correct all right and then so what happened was is of the 45 million dollars okay the vast majority of that was sent to the um, consolidated, consolidated funds fund to pay for recurrent so mm -hmm. what did that does nancy um, frank will know this it disguises really the strength of the recovery in the economy because we know that 35 million dollars of, of, of the hundred of the hundred dollar surplus that you're talking about came from here that should have never gone in to pay recurrent expenditures ah. it should have been used to drive capital expenditures or remained there to act as a reserve fund because when you come to the credit raging agencies come here and the mm -hmm. IMF and the World Bank come they're actually more impressed with what you have in the savings. So you, you and I know a very good businessman person in Solution, my father. Mm -hmm. And my father used to say to me, Frank will, will, will agree with this, he used to say to me, it's not how much money you earn, my brother, it's how much money you save. save. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, let's get to Frank. Frank, welcome to the round table. Um, and it's a pleasure to have you. Perhaps let's just start off your brief summary. You've listened to the Prime Minister, you heard his um, 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 speech, and you've also had a chance maybe to look at the numbers. Now, I want to be very, very careful here because you're on a round table, it's a United Workers Party show, and I do not want anybody to accuse you of being political. I want you to be as professional as possible so that when you leave here, nobody throws any stones at you. So tell us, what are your thoughts on the presentation um, by the Prime Minister and the estimates of revenue and expenditure for this year? I think <laughs> the part about throwing stones, it will happen no matter what. Okay. <laughs> so I don't think one has to be too concerned about that. Um, I had a sort of cursory glance at the at the at the at the budget, not in any great detail, but mm -hmm. there are there are all sorts of little things that draws one's attention, and you start to wonder um, whether whether it all ties together because it's seemingly there's a disparity in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. For example, we, we, we seem to think that um, we do have a problem if with um, national security, etc. In, in this country. But yet still, when I look at the summary of, of, of the budget, there seems to be no real commitment in terms of funds allocated to that particular ministry, the Department of Home Affairs and National Security. Mm -hmm. It's down from 26 million yeah, it's about the same, 26.6, yes. 26.7. It's the same thing. Um, food security, an important matter for us. Agriculture. Of agriculture mm -hmm. 145 to 143. Not much movement there. And you, you start to wonder again, are we thinking? Um, we have the ministry, the Department of Infrastructure. We've, well, we've spoken about that. And it's cut from 170 to 122 in the year of infrastructure, which is a rather unusual thing. Um, usually infrastructure is used to um, kickstart the economy. If right. you remember the United States, when um, <coughs> Biden was trying to get the economy going, he plunged a whole pile of stuff into mm -hmm. bridges, bridges and yes. roads, etc. and so on. But here we seem to be doing the, the, exact, opposite. the exact opposite. So things like that do have you a little bit concerned. We have problems with um, our whole social setting. We have our problems with crime, etc., and so on. So the Ministry of Equity and ju Social Justice and Empowerment, where you do need a lot of support, again, they're cut by a fairly substantial amount, probably about $20, $20 million. Um, <clears throat> so you go through, then you're not seeing the things that one expects. You want to see the behavior in the, in the community reflected in the budget. Ministry of Youth, Sports, and Development slight increase from 186 to 191. Mm -hmm. We're always pounding the youth, but so I would expect it to have seen a larger commitment here. Um, so w when you look at the budget in a sense, you, you get a sense it's not something pulled together nicely. It's, it's, the numbers are just moving around. So we end up at approximately the same total spend 
for this year as for ah, last year. Nothing really okay. happened. Okay. All right. right. So what we had was jockeying and that's, jockeying around the last That's interesting. When we, when we think of security, we never really always include justice. Yes. Mm -hmm. So l listen to what, the, what it says here, because it, in the in the estimates, it mm -hmm. also has reports, updated right. reports on the, what the status is. So for the area of the DPP's office, it says we continue to battle the backlog within the, the confines of limited resources made available to the DPP's office. In the last budget cycle, there was no additional resources provided. We were able to, within the last year, to complete a matter which was 22 years old. The contingent of lawyers is grossly insufficient to tackle this backlog effectively, and my proposal for the engagement by retired police prosecutors on contract was not accepted by the government. So that is the report for 23-24, but yet still in this financial year, justice remained the same. That's what mm -hmm. you're saying, Frank, as well. 26-26, yeah, yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. So they've not taken into consideration anything that you've read there to say, okay, let's make an additional allocation. Mm -hmm. So we know when it came to healthcare and when it comes to security, what we're doing is inadequate. And the report all the way through says, says that. the same this thing. says the same thing. And you went and you put a special tax on, but the tax is not reflected Reflective in that. anything that's changed. Well, let's get back to Frank again. So, Frank, there's been a lot of talk in St. Lucia about debt and borrowing and how government is borrowing money. Um, if you can share a little bit of what are your thoughts on debts and borrowing, and in particular, you now have government guarantees, which is the next mm -hmm. big thing in St. Lucia. And we've heard about government guaranteeing an $80 million loan to the National Lotteries Authority. From your perspective as a chartered accountant, what are your thoughts on government guaranteeing that money outside of a lot of information we've been hearing about, no financials presented, um, the accountability of that money and why is government guaranteeing money to an entity that does not even own the infrastructure and all these things. What are your thoughts and tell us a little bit about that. Um, there's nothing wrong in borrowing. One has to understand that in the first instance. Although I think the older persons used to think that first you should save the money and then spend. But when you do that you don't go as fast as you should be going and naturally borrowing is okay. The problem with, with the whole concept about borrowing is ensuring that you do have the, um, the, the proper disclosure of what is happening so all parties concerned can um, actually appreciate what is going on and one can determine where the performance is as it should be. Now within the um, accounting, uh, accounting fraternity, we've been trying to get the governments, in fact it's a global thing, here I'm talking about the international community, mm -hmm. to adopt international public sector accounting standards. Because a lot of governments operate on a cash basis and because of that they leave out a, lo a lot of liabilities, if you will, at the cutoff point, so you never get a full sense of, um, of what is going on. So have, had we adopted this in St. Lucia, I think it's only Jamaica, Trinidad and, and, um, and, and um, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, mm -hmm. to a certain extent have, have adopted it. And when I was president of the Institute of Child Accounts of the Caribbean, in my last address, I issued a call for action, if you will, that's what, 11, 10 years ago, that we really have to go in this direction. Now, had we gone that direction, this thing that's happening with the NLA, the door would have been shut there in a sense that even if you would, if they did go that route of what they did, it would still be pulled in to the accounts in, um, in, in government. Mm -hmm. Because the NLA, from what I understanding, I'm understanding, there are no accounts available to justify a bank giving them that loan. Right. And the bank in itself has to be, not to be careful here, but the bank has to be questioned as to why you would give a loan to an entity that has no real substance. Because from what I'm understanding, the, the NLA does not seem to have a mandate to do, in, to do what it wants to do. No. Its income is probably on par with what it, it has to pay back on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. but yet still it has its administrative expenses to take care of. So clearly it would not um, qualify for a loan because typically when a bank lends money, the intention is that I am going to make some interest. They're not concerned so much about the loan being paid back, but they want to make the, the money interest. off it. That's, that's the essence of being a bank. And once you move away from that, why are you lending the money in the first place? And on the other side of it now, um, 
the, the bank has to recognize now that if you have an entity you lending them money, there's no real guarantee they can pay back the loan. They now have to provide for, for that particular loan, right? So and the provisions are going to be high. It mm -hmm. So it, it's all around, it's a rather messy affair simply because of, of this lack of trans transparency and so on in the whole thing. So I get concerned when I see situations like that. And um, it does not augur well either for the bank or for, for, for government. So, in your opinion, so, before I get back to you, because I know that there's a letter that you wrote as well, and I want to get that. But in your opinion, what should have happened if government needed that $80 million? Because we're also hearing that whilst government is guaranteeing the loan, construction has already started on the various projects that they intend mm -hmm. to use the money on and that is where the opposition and even the general public is calling about accountability how should that have process have have have, well, have gone through if it had gone through in the sort of way you would have expected it to go through one would expect the 80 million in, in dollars actually it's a fairly large amount in the context of our local banks what would have expected the government to perhaps go to the regional the, the regional market and borrow those funds in one way, shape, or form or the other. Now, the question arises now, is there a problem in that regard? That government couldn't get that money there and they were seeking the money elsewhere. And my feeling is now that $80 million is a lot of money for a bank. And I would have thought government would go to the bank where we have a significant ownership interest to give them Bank the of St. Lucia. Bank of St. Lucia. So there are too many things around that makes me uncomfortable. Well, I think the leader of the opposition has a different opinion mm -hmm. that maybe it's not necessarily, and I hope he will clarify if I am wrong, but I don't think that the leader of the opposition think it's an issue where they probably could not get the loan. I think his case has been that government has been instituting or spending money to put proper procurement guidelines in place and trying to get things up on a straight and narrow, but government is using this as a sidebar to get money in a different source that doesn't go through the government's procurement guidelines. Am I correct in, in that assertion or is it something else? And, and tell us, it why is. do you think so, so? Well, I've given the government the opportunity to clarify, right? Because we have been through a very bad experience in this country with government guarantees. And because of that, the Act, the Finance Act, was amended mm -hmm. to strengthen um, the protocols, the, the procedures that we have to go through in giving a guarantee. So. The question is, how can a government come to Parliament to seek a guarantee for the NLA, which there's red flags that, we, that are raised already, um, to pay for projects that have already begun, yet you cannot provide any details as to how the money is going to be spent. How much money is being spent on Darren Samuel Stadium? How much money is being done on the Groslay Field? How much money is going to be spent on Mindo Filler Park? Did you see the financial statements for national lotteries in the presentation? No, nothing. So, I mean, as I'm saying to you, a lot of red flags were so raised. So, how were you able to vote? Or what is it that was expected of you to be able to vote to say, yes, I can give that guarantee? I didn't. But I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, the eyes will have it. But it was expected that you would vote on it and support it on what basis? Correct, and that's the problem. And then I thought that the debate in the Senate even brought greater clarity. And it was in the Senate. So you spent a whole day debating this in the House. Prime Minister, Minister of Finance presented it. And it's not until you got to the Senate, the leader of government business in the Senate presented the thing, said nothing, and it's when um, Mr. Stanislaus brought up the issue about the legality of the NLA getting the guarantee in the first place, they said, oh, it's SSI, St. Lucia Sports Incorporated, that's doing. Now, that makes sense because the assets are owned by SSI. SSI, right? But the question becomes, why was that not declared in the first instance? So, so hold on. You're saying that government guaranteed a loan that National Lotteries is taking from a bank to give the money to Sports St. Lucia Inc. Correct. So it's almost like... There's something wrong. And right. that you didn't feel the necessity to say that. Furthermore, work already began. That's even more troubling. Who who's is, the contractor? Who's the contractor? And also, who's doing the quantities? Is it a real cost 
are we getting value for our money? And so our understanding is, is that the contractor was hand selected. And the connections of the contractor back to ministers, you see, that's where we ultimately will go. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't start at that process. If you if 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 there was transparency to what Frank was saying, maybe many of these questions would have been asked earlier. So this government has has mastered the art of coming to the house and giving us half truths and making it seem like it's one thing, but when we look behind it, we start recognizing it's something completely different. And I'll get back to CIP to see how dangerous it is. But this NLA issue is very dangerous. How could the issue be resolved? And that's what the letter was about. The letter said, okay, on one hand, on the same day you borrowed $100 million from the World Bank, and that the, the first pillar of the World Bank's loan, policy of the World Bank's loan, was to strengthen your Finance Act, and particularly your procurement procedures, how you do contracting. Mm -hmm. Okay? On the same day, you approve a guarantee to the NLA for $80 million. And because the NLA is a statutory agency, it falls outside Side of the, the finance guide. Act. So mm -hmm. I said, if I am to believe that this was not deliberate attempt to bypass the Finance Act, mm -hmm. then there should have been a condition to the guarantee. And the condition should have been that you have to use the same procurement, procurement guidelines, guidelines that government uses. That is the issue. Now, those are the first things to get resolved. But once we get past that, Nancy, there are many more questions to be asked. And I think that when solutions start getting the answers to those questions is how disturbing this be. And I think that Frank when, said... When that we are running out of time... But I want to admit mm -hmm. this is a very important point. The loan is $80 million. The repayment of the loan is $600,000 a, a month. month for 15 years. And, and 600,000 is the estimated amount that the lotteries take in per month. Correct. Correct. But the nature of the lottery's income is also... Yes, but look at because the it's, it's from of gambling. It's, it's associated with gambling. And anything can happen going forward to interrupt the cash flow. So it's almost guaranteed that the government is going to have to accept its responsibilities as the guarantor. So I wanted Lucians to note as well, in terms of the estimates, for the first time, I don't know if it was there before, but for the first time in a long time, there is a subvention now. for, the, And so that, that more or less certifies that what we've been saying about NLA and the income is true. Government has never had to give NLA money. In fact, NLA has been the one financing youth and sports activities. For the first time, there is a subvention of $100,000. No, in, no. $1.8 Sorry, $1.8 million. $1 um, there's a subvention. Government is going to give NLE $1.8 million in this year's estimates of expenditure. So it seems to suggest that NLE will and not have sufficient money for its but normal operations and government will have to finance The way that this was this. done and how the NLE board, board works. Okay, you were on the NLE board. Yes. If it got a loan for $80 million, there's no provisions because we didn't see the loan, the, the loan agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay? We've not seen the loan agreement. We have not seeing the agreement between the NLA and, and SSI. SSI, okay? So who's to say that some of the $80 million is not going to be used for recurrent expenditures of the NLA? So what they're saying basically, kick the can down the street, let me get the cash right now, I can decide who and how I want to spend the money. Because nobody's, there's no nobody's there to, uh, to no provide the oversight, oversight yeah. right? So again now with CIP, next year we have a bigger problem. Because the government has launched a new program of which they have not told solutions anything about, which is an infrastructural program. And it's similar to the... The donation. Mm -hmm. So it's the same price as the donation, $100,000. So if you're identified as a company that can build infrastructure in St. Lucia, you're allowed to go out and sell the passports for $100,000 and you keep all of the money. And that the money now is used to pay for the road, road construction, infrastructure projects, we don't know. And I have evidence to show that that has been sold in the market already, already? for $80,000. Well, now, I, think, so I think we need to discuss that a little bit further correct. on another program, but my producers are telling me we're running out of time, and I want us to wrap up with debt, 
debt to GDP, what does that mean? Because this is something, again, that the government is touting about. So, Frank, maybe if you can just explain it for the ordinary St. Lucians to understand. What is debt to GDP? How does that impact us? But the, um, the NLU loan, if you will, fits in quite nicely into that. Because, because it typically adds it would have been increasing our debt, debt for the debt, um, the government's debt, which means that the debt GDP ratio would Rises. be increasing. Okay. But the thing is, what we have in this debt GDP thing is that the the GDP is the denominator, if you will, in the factor. Right. And the larger the denominator, the lower the debt ratio goes. But the thing is, in current times, the denominator has been impacted by a lot of um, temporary increases, if you will, because of supply chain factor, cost of goods, etc., and so on. So the appearance is there that the debt GDP ratio is not as high as it should be. But in reality, it if is. you look at it as a constant factor, it is. Because they, so they, they, they look for technicalities to precisely. move all kinds of numbers precisely. from it, and just like the unemployment figures, so that it doesn't that look so this. bad. And that's another concern I have from this, the, un the unemployment figures. That one is, it, it, it defies logic in a sense. I understand that is because, and perhaps um, the leader of the opposition can explain this better than I can, I understand that the method of computing this has changed, so you can't really compute, um, compare, compare one period, one period. if another. Mm -hmm. But when you go back, they're talking about, the government is talking about going back 16 years to compare the, um, the, 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 that factor, mm -hmm. the unemployment. But the thing is, so many things have has happened changed over the, over the years. years. Disasters financial meltdowns, etc., and so on. So there's absolutely no way what they're saying is the truth. But the point is, it, it has to come home to roost sometime. It's like, for example, in my business, when I, the, one of the things that are often used by, by unscrupulous businessmen is to manipulate the inventory because it's that thing that you've got to count every year end. But there comes a time when it all comes home to roost. At that time it comes in. Unfortunately, I hope that doesn't happen to us. I hope so too. Well, we have to wrap up. Um, it's been, the discussions has been really, really wonderful and exciting. There's still a lot more that we need to discuss. So, so I'm hoping that during the presentation of the appropriation bill, we'll have some more discussion on the estimates and the policies hand in hand. But I will hand over to you, political leader, if you can wrap up, tell us your final thoughts on the estimates of revenue and expenditure, and maybe any final things that you really wanted to clarify. So it'd be, it'd be, look, this is just the first step. It, the, we're only dealing with numbers. Yes. It's for the government to explain a lot of things. And then when we get the social and economic review, we'll have more details on the calculations of all these things. But it's it suffice to say, let us look at the IMF report. Mm -hmm. The IMF report did not say what the unemployment numbers were for last year or this year. Wow. Okay? That's a very telling uh, sign. And Do you think that's deliberate or just? I think it's because that there was a different methodology that was used. Okay. So, and, 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 and in all fairness to the statistical department, they said so. So that when, every time that the prime minister was standing up and, and wanting to make a comparison, I stood on the point of order mm -hmm. to say you cannot say that because the numbers are not comparable. The second thing is that IMF report is saying to us, watch out your debt to GDP is increasing. Okay. Okay. And the preliminary numbers from the estimates are very worrying to me because they would always be an initial pickup of a tax mm -hmm. but as the economy starts to adjust to the tax and genuinely speaking taxes causes the economy to go down we've seen with tourism tourism has not gotten back to its original number and there's no way given the hotel closures um, and everything else that's taking place in the market today that the hotel sector is going to, to recover to the extent it is. What you would have expected is that construction would have been continued, used to, to, stimulate. to, to stimulate, but we've seen the opposite. A in the we're, seeing a, an, mm -hmm. in, uh, we're seeing a substantial reduction, and particularly the construction that is taking place is coming at a very high cost because it's government that has having to drive it rather than getting the private sector to fund the program. Mm -hmm. So. The, the IMF said that the debt to GDP is going to 75%. So remember, before COVID, we were at, 69? at, six, at 61. 61? Okay. Mm -hmm. After um, the first year of COVID, 
it went to 91. Right. Why? Because exactly what mm -hmm. Mr. Meyer said. Yes. The GDP contracted by 24%, right? But your expenses went up, mm -hmm. right? So the debt to GDP and, well, and the borrowing that you had right. went up. Today now, we are in a, a very difficult situation because we're seeing that debt is increasing faster than the growth of GDP. And already, it's gone to 75%. And if the economy does not grow, and the projection is the economy was going to grow by 3%, mm -hmm. and that they're projecting next year by 1.5%, and with the amount of borrowings that we're doing, it means that the debt is going to continue to grow faster. faster if, if that does, it means the debt to GDP is going to grow. And already there are telltale signs that the, 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 the bond market is not confident about the direction this country is heading in. Okay, well, there you have it. So, Frank, your final thoughts on the estimates um, for 24-25? Actually, was the, uh, the IMF report, which I noted was delayed in, in, in being released. And there was no satisfactory explanation given for it. But ultimately, it appears to me when one reads the report of the website that the report was released to the public without the normal closeout meeting that one gets between government and the IMF. Oh, okay. And for that to happen, there must be cause, cause for concern. And these are the sort of things that we should be looking at. Alrighty. Well, St. Lucia, there you have it. Another episode of the Roundtable. And we have been discussing the estimates of revenue and expenditure for 2024-2025. You heard from various former government ministers. You heard from the leader of the opposition. And you also heard from a chartered accountant what their thoughts are on the presentation by the Prime Minister for 2024-2025. We will be reviewing the appropriation bill when the Honorable Prime Minister presents, I think later on this month, and we will try as much as possible to break it down for you so you understand what is happening and what the Prime Minister is saying in his speech, but what the numbers and the figures are showing. So thank you very much for watching another episode of the Roundtable. I wish you a wonderful weekend. Thank you and good night. This levy will not be imposed on any food items. This means, Mr. Speaker, that the cost of food should not change because of the levy.